Uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name's Greg Hodge, and I'm the Managing Director of Circo Systems. It gives me great pleasure to welcome everybody today on the day of the opening of the 44th Parliament. It's so close. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our guest tonight, uh, Dennis Richardson, the Secretary of Defence. As the Managing Director of Circo, I can categorically state that it's Circo is proud to be a partner with ASPE, which encourages and informs discussion on a whole range of topics. These partnerships, this partnership, are critical to fostering closer links between the private sector and government. Ladies and gentlemen, much has changed in the last period, in the period since the last event. Today we have a new government. We have some challenging public statements made by our new Defence Minister. We have a relatively new Secretary of Defence. And we certainly have some significant and real pressures across all aspects of Defence today. Circo Systems is a systems and services integration organisation. We deliver engineering, we deliver logistics support, we deliver asset management, we deliver training and technical services to defence, to customs and to national security markets. And we stand ready to support government and defence in achieving their objectives in bringing our broader and bringing our broader international expertise and local experience to the table. With this in mind, I was heartened by the remarks of our new Defence Minister. This year he, he, he affirmed his commitment to a new Defence White Paper. He stated it will be a consulted plan it will be a costed plan and it will have a huge amount of common sense in it. On that note, ladies and gentlemen, Dennis Richardson began his career, began, sorry, Dennis Richardson became the Secretary of Defence in October last year. Prior to this, he had a number of senior leadership roles within the Australian Public Service. Dennis was Secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs between January 2010 and October 2012. He has been the Ambassador of Australia to the United States. He has been the Director General of ASIO and the Depart Deputy Secretary in the Department of Immigration and Citizenship. Following on from Stephen's comments earlier, that is credibility. This is a rich and diverse path and I have no doubt that Dennis is prepared for these challenges ahead. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce and formally welcome the Secretary of Defence, Mr Dennis Richardson. Uh, thanks, Greg. Um, for that, the uh, most welcoming words in all of that was the fact that you introduced me as relatively new. I normally get introduced as a veteran, which uh, is code word for tired and worn or very experienced, which is code word for having been a long, around a long time. So I'm delighted that I am relatively new. Uh, the, um, I'd like to thank you, Greg and Circo, for, ho for hosting, uh, well, for sponsoring this evening. Uh, that is something I uh, really appreciate. Uh, Stephen, thank you to you uh, for your kind words, and thank you to ASPE all the work uh, that ASPE does. I'd also like to acknowledge Alan Hawke, a, a former Secretary of Defence, and also Angus Hewson, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the former Chief of the Defence Force. Um, as, as Greg said, uh, I've been Secretary of the Department of Defence for just over a year, and tonight I want to talk about how I see my own job um, the role of civilians in defence and reform in the department. 
One disclaimer, I'm not a defence theologian and the words I use should be understood in their plain English meaning. Uh, I have that trouble every day. Uh, I, I think the starting point for any discussion about defence must be recognition that it remains a federation, not a unitary state. A central challenge is to continue the drive towards a unitary state while respecting the history and traditions of the component parts which make up the total enterprise. I think my own job can be broken down into five principal tasks. First, within the framework of the meaning of that wonderful word, diarchy, and anyone who's watched Doctor Who would know what a diarchy is, <laughs> but uh, within the framework of the meaning of that wonderful word, to work with the CDF to provide the leadership and direction to defence to seek to ensure that it operates as a coherent whole in professionally meeting the requirements of government. Second, working with the CDF to ensure that the government receives professional policy advice. In particular, on my part, to see that there is a highly effective civilian policy capability so that policy drives operations, not the other way around. And partly because of the understandable focus on operations over the past 10 to 15 years, the, the defence civilian policy capability is not as strong as it should be. Third, to seek to ensure that defence APS staff are highly professional so that the men and women of the ADF have everything they need to do the best job possible, especially in an operational environment. This includes everything from acquisition and sustainment provided by the Defence Materiel Organisation to the creative capability which resides in the Defence Science and Technology Organisation to estate management. Fourth, to ensure that the highly regarded intelligence agencies which reside in Defence maintain and where possible enhance their professionalism and capabilities. I refer, of course, to the Australian Signals Directorate, the Australian Geospatial Intelligence Organisation and the Defence Intelligence Organisation. In addition, we also have the Australian Government Security Betting Agency, which manages security clearances for much of the Commonwealth. Fifth and finally, my job is to ensure that the administration and finances of defence are managed as effectively and as efficiently as possible so that the taxpayer gets value for money. And this is not a simple exercise in paper shuffling. It involves the management of one of the largest property holdings in Australia, including training areas in three World Heritage Areas. It involves managing over 250 active projects, which includes more than 180 major projects with an average budget of 400 million. And that is primarily managed out of DMO. It involves managing an annual operating budget of over 25 billion or, as calculated by Mark Thompson in this year's ASPE budget brief, a total spend of $69,680,980.82 every day. It involves the administration of personnel matters for over 100,000 people, including just over 56,000 in the permanent ADF, 25,000 in the reserves, and around 20,600 in the APS. Of course, 
the big numbers tell us that we have a big job, but they do not tell us how well that job is done. Inevitably, the answer is mixed. Defence remains too much of a federation. Numerous reports by the Australian National Audit Office have, have highlighted an absence of personal accountability, and that remains a major challenge. Cultural issues have been highlighted by the CDF and service chiefs, and that remains an issue for all of us. It is not the preserve of the uniform. ICT remains underinvested. But it would be wrong to see defence as, quote, broken, unquote. Who would say that of the ADF itself? Who would say that of our intelligence agencies? The Canard Review of 2003 and the Mortimer Review of 2008 significantly improved our acquisition processes. Perhaps even more importantly, but far less glamorous, is the improvement in our accounts, something as boring as the accounts. In 2003-04, the Department of Defence had a total of 75 findings by the ANAO, 27 Category A findings, which are significant, and 48 Category B findings. In, uh, in 2012-13, there were zero Category A findings and eight Category B findings. This is a genuinely impressive achievement, owed to the hard work of my predecessors, service chiefs, group heads, and the chief financial officer, Philip Pryor, and also the internal auditor himself, Jeff Brown, who is here tonight. While some reform continues across defence, it has, to a significant extent, run out of steam. In my view, this is due to two factors. The understandable cynicism in the department arising from the strategic reform program launched in the context of the 2009 Defence White Paper. No sooner had this program been announced and sold within the department when broader fiscal measures not only led to a moving of the goalposts but to their cutting down for use as firewood. The perhaps inevitable retreat of a large organisation to a comfortable status quo was also a significant reason why I believe we have largely run out of reform, uh, we have largely run out of steam on the reform side. It is against this background that the Commission of Audit and the foreshadowed review of the Department are to be welcomed. Combined with the White Paper to be prepared over the next 18 months, I hope that we're able to see an energised and contemporary reform program built around realistic and achievable goals. One of the other matters on which I'd like to touch on this evening is the role of civilians in the total defence enterprise. There is a bit of a tendency for some to see defence civilians as constituting something as a back end supporting the ADF front end. Defence civilians do not need to be gratuitously told by anyone that the purpose of their work is to ensure that the men and women of the ADF are able to professionally protect and further the national interest as directed by government. Indeed, over 20% of defence civilians are former ADF members themselves and some others are partners of serving ADF members. We have an integrated workforce where many civilians report to uniformed personnel and many of the latter report to the former. Try telling someone in Special Operations Command that a civilian in the Australian Signals Directorate is back-end and by implication 
not particularly essential to the task in hand. Try telling a fighter pilot that civilian engineers and technicians are not essential to their operational capability. Try telling ADF personnel on operations that civilians responsible for their pay and allowances are less than essential. Clearly, there should, there should not be one more civilian in defence than is absolutely necessary. This, no doubt, will be an important focus of the forthcoming review, and that is a good thing. In this context, I note that the ratio of defence APS to ADF personnel has not changed very much over the years, and we need to examine whether we can do better. Equally, we need to be conscious of the fact that over the last 10 years, almost a thousand ADF positions have been deliberately civilianised as part of a reform effort to ensure that uniform personnel are not doing jobs which can, which can be performed equally by civilians at lower costs. Also, it is worth noting that in Australia, we automatically count in the Defence APS statistics those who work in the Australian Signals Directorate and those who work in the Australian Geospatial Intelligence Organisation. Their counterparts are not so counted in the UK, the US or in Canada. Finally, on the general issue of civilians, I would note that since the 30th of June 2012, the number of defence APS has reduced from 22,284 to 20,641. That is a reduction of around 1,600 since June of last year. And the downward trend continues, as indeed it should. I'd like to wrap up by returning to the subject of reform, which has been in process on and off for some four decades, starting with the Tang Report in 1973, which saw the merger of five departments into one. When we look across the broad sweep of reform over the years, across numerous military and civilian leaders, ministers and governments, we do see some clear trends. The centralisation of military command and creation of a joint operational capability. Outsourcing of non-operational capability wherever possible. A more integrated ADF APS workforce. The introduction of shared services in areas such as human resources, ICT, finance and non-equipment uh, procurement. Continued strengthening and scrutiny of the capability development and material acquisition processes. Centralisation of management and command accountability in the offices of the Secretary and of the CDF. In addition to these broad trends, some specific reforms have had institutional value and symbolism beyond their public acknowledgement. In this context, I've already mentioned our achievement on the accounts front. Of equal importance, especially in terms of its symbolism, has been the amalgamation of mess facilities on bases something which would have been deemed impossible 20 years ago. Indeed, some mess facilities have been closed altogether, such as those at Russell. That reforms of this kind can and do occur may seem trivial in one sense, but it highlights the preparedness of defence personnel to embrace reform even when it impacts negatively on long-held traditions. Of course, reform is not always easy and does not happen in a vacuum. 
Certainly, where vested interests are concerned, and they do exist in defence, as they do in all government agencies, political will in institutional leadership is essential. A clear sense of what works and what does not work is also vital. And consistency and perseverance is central. The Commission of Audit, the forthcoming review and the new white paper will no doubt lay down a pathway for further reform. That is a challenge to be embraced. Thank you. Very happy to take any questions on anything I've covered or on anything you want to make up yourselves. <laughs> <laughs>
granted that, that there is a review. Uh, and, and I've got to say, uh, I wasn't so much seeking to defend defence civilians. I don't think that I don't think the work of defence civilians need to, needs to be defended. I'm simply trying to put the defence workforce in some sort of context. We are integrated. We have had a process of civilianising certain positions that were previously held, held, held by uniformed personnel. Uh, the, uh, the fact is that you can talk to anyone in Special Operations Command and they'll soon tell you uh, who are central enablers and they don't, certainly don't consider central enablers to be some sort of uh, um, second-rate back-enders. I, I, and I'm not referring to the minister in that, I'm referring to a constant stream of commentary which I sometimes read. Well, obviously there's, there's a review into all of this, but you're, you're in a better position than anyone to give a kind of front basic uh, assessment of it. Do you, how much scope do you see for a change in that ratio of roughly and, and might it be possible, and you, you raised the example of DST, obviously as, as the nature of warfare and, and defending our nation uh, changes, we, we're, never, we're, we're not going to need fewer DSD people as a proportion of the overall defence staff. However, we may find that we need fewer, say, infantry or artillery people. Um, might it be possible that the, the ratio actually goes in, in the opposite direction to what we actually like? No, I would hope it wouldn't, because I do believe uh, I believe this is this is the, my view. I think would be shared by everyone in defence. You should not have one more civilian in defence than is absolutely necessary. I mean, the purpose of the defence enterprise is the capability that you are able to put into the field to protect and further your national interest. I think we would all sign up to that. And if none of us are committed to that, then you shouldn't be in defence. So, so the pressure, there's got to be a downward pressure on, on the number of civilians. It is right when you look at, at numbers and when you look at savings to look first at your civilian group. Equally, you need to appreciate that, that civilians uh, account for only 8% of the defence budget. Uh, of the, of the defence personnel costs, 75 to 77% of them are ADF personnel costs. Uh, so uh, you can, uh, we should squeeze the lemon tighter. I, d I believe it can be squeezed tighter. How much, I don't know. I am simply trying to, uh, to, to articulate uh, certain parameters for that. You know, for instance, as I said, you know, if you go to, if you go to uh, people often get into the bizarre game of comparing number of civilians in Australia with number of defence civilians in the UK. I'm like, well, bloody UK defence does not count the equivalent of the Australian Signals Directorate. They do not count the equivalent of the Australian Geospatial Intelligence Organisation. But we do. And we just look at all, we have a tendency to just talk about all civilians as though, as though they're all lazy pen pushers sitting around doing nothing. And it's an integrated workforce which works differently to that. That's all. It's simple. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Richardson, um, given your perspective as the former Department Secretary of Department of Foreign Affairs, uh, and you come from DFAT to see that this is. <laughs> and now your perspective uh, within the defence. To what extent do you think Australia's future defence and security challenges are for the Department of Defence as opposed to a better coordinated whole of government approach that involves other agencies? Oh, I mean, it's clearly both. Um, Jeff, I mean, you know as well as. I mean, First of all, we're not badly coordinated now. I mean, I, the, the, the process of coordination has been going on and improving in government for 20 years or more. Now, when I was head of the International Division in Prime Minister and Cabinet, believe it or not, between 1988 and 1990, 
there was something called the Defence Security Committee, which met about three times a year, essentially to consider issues relating to the intelligence community. In 1996, we had the National Security Committee of form, uh, formed uh, under the Howard government. That continued under the Rudd Gillard Rudd governments, and um, it's continued uh, under under the Abbott government. And each iteration has refined it. And I think the coordination is pretty good. I think I think we have lessons to learn out of Afghanistan. I think there is sometimes a bit of hesitancy in DFAT to take part in things that might dirty your hands. And, uh, and uh, so uh, I think the cooperation we've seen in the Solomons, in East Timor, uh, Timor-Lesse, uh, and in Afghanistan, we need to build on that. I think it's in that area inside the operational theatre where I think there is scope to improve our coordination. More broadly across government, I would think it works pretty well. Mick, I think you had your hand up. Thank you very much, uh, Dennis. I, I thought that secretaries were not meant to say anything during uh, a speech, but I forgot <laughs> that you were Dennis Richards. Uh, 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 can I ask, right at the beginning you said that, uh, you wanted to further break down the silos. What exactly did you mean by that? I think it's best left vague. Uh, I mean, I mean, I, I I know what I mean, uh, but uh, you know, I mean, I'm prepared to do certain things, but I'm not prepared to have to wear a uh, helmet and flak jacket to work tomorrow morning. <laughs> Further questions, Anthony. Anthony Bergen from ASPE. Do I need a mic? Um, this is really more drawing on your role as uh, former ambassador in DG Asia. And it's a remark that uh, Greg Sheridan wrote either today or yesterday. And he said, during the Cold War, the Americans at some point were worried about Australia's capability to keep secrets. Now, it's the reverse. And uh, I'd just be interested in your comment on the uh, on Greg's observation? Well, Greg's article specifically referred to the late 1940s. Yes. Uh, that's how it started off, yes. and he was absolutely right on that. Mm. Uh, and indeed, I think most academics now acknowledge that what was once considered a conspiracy uh, you know, was in fact a legitimate concern on the part of the UK and the uh, part of the US in the late 40s leading to the establishment of, uh, of, of, of ASIO. Um, uh, look, I've got no comment to make on present day uh, US. I think there's been an enormous challenge there with Snowden. I get irritated every time I see reference to uh, Snowden as a whistleblower. I thought whistleblowers uh, revealed things that were illegal. Uh, 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 as far as I'm concerned, Snowden is probably nothing more than a garden variety criminal, uh, but that's a personal view. Uh, it's not an official view. Uh, and, um, um, you know, uh, what, he's, uh, what he's gone on about was, uh, was based on legislation. It was uh, based on proper judicial processes in the US, and it was based on the approval of the executive. Um, uh, the uh, I think I, I think the US has been under a lot of pressure in respect of Snowden, uh, and I would not second I would not want to second guess the way they have the way they have responded to that. We have not been under the same pressure, therefore I think we need to be cautious in the way we might second guess other people's response. Got time for one or two more questions? I think there's a question here. Between Australia and Indonesia at the moment? 
Well, in respect of the first part of your question, you'll forgive me if I say I have no further comment to make on water operational matters. <laughs> uh, that's in respect of the second part of your, uh, of your question. Uh, I think, uh, I, think um, uh, I think the relationship between Australia and Indonesia is in good shape. Uh, I agree with the comments made by uh, the Foreign Minister. Uh, now you may say, well you would, uh, you're a government official, but I was in Indonesia last week myself on, uh, on Thursday and Friday with the Minister for Defence and uh, you know, I think, uh, I think the issues that are that are arisen uh, that are arisen are understandable. Uh, it's perfectly understandable that uh, Indonesia has asked us certain questions about allegations in the media. It's perfectly proper that we have shown sensitivity to those questions and have responded in the way we have. Uh, I think, uh, in terms of in terms of people smuggling, we have legitimate issues there as a country, uh, as a government, and I think uh, we are pursuing those matters with Indonesia in the, uh, in the, uh, in the proper way. Uh, and the fact that you don't always get precise agreement on all issues all the time shouldn't surprise anyone. If there are no further questions... Yep. Last question. Dennis, you touched on the challenge for the next white paper being alignment of budget and capability. Um, do you think there's a big gap between you know, capability and aspirations and an available budget? And if there is... Sorry, between a... a capability requirement yeah. aspirations and available budget? If there is a gap, how do you see that, that process unfolding to you? Well, I, look, uh, it sounds very bland, but that's clearly a decision for the government. In, in the process of the white paper. I, I mean, I can't, I can't add to that. First of all, we have to establish uh, whether there is a gap, if there is a gap, what we do about it, uh, and the like. And that, as I said, will be a central challenge in the white paper, which I think Minister Johnson has in fact been uh, uh, very open about. Ladies and gentlemen, on your behalf, could I invite uh, Greg Hodge to come up to uh, move a vote of thanks to Dennis for that uh, comprehensive address and response to questions. Greg? Thanks, Steve. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you'll agree that Dennis has given us a bit to think about today. If I can pick up just a couple of points, and of course the beauty of standing up here is you don't have right of reply. <laughs> Um, your introduction comments, Dennis, where you outlined the five, five aspects of your job, there was a very sobering number in that, 69 million a day, almost 70 million a day. And I'd like to actually sort of put to everybody here whether your uniform, civilian, former uniform, or indeed defence industry, that we have an obligation to actually make sure that we are delivering value for money in the pursuit of government's objectives. So that is just one comment I'd like to add to that, uh, Dennis. Dennis, I'd also like to pick up on a point. You used the word defence is broken. And I'm afraid I don't like that word in any context whatsoever because I think the connotations are poor, are bad. And I'm not being personally critical. Defence is doing a really good job and there are lots of uniformed people out there, supported by civilian people and supported by defence industry, working hard and doing a hard job, whether it be uh, in Afghanistan or in border protection or wherever we are. There is, of course, always in any organisation of the size that you outlined, some areas that can be approved. That is natural. and. It's very refreshing that those are being attacked 
uh, vigorously by yourself and your team. Constant improvement is indeed an aim of everybody, I think, in their companies, in their departments, or in uniform. I'd like to actually add to your defence civilian numbers, because while I don't have the number off the top of my head, there are something in the order of 30,000 in defence industry supporting those defence civilians and defence in uniform. So it is indeed a big operation moving forward. But not paid for by the taxpayer. <laughs> yes. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to take the opportunity to formally thank Dennis for speaking tonight. It's been a privilege to host and to support ASPE uh, in this event. Um, and please join me in thanking the Secretary. Thank you.